Let me introduce now Janet Cardiff and George Buren Miller. The artists are international, recognized for their immersive multimedia sound installations and their audio video walks. They have created recent video walks at the Walt Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles in 2019 and for the Fruit Market Gallery in Edinburgh in 2019. Cardiff and Miller have shown at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the same here, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Monterrey in Mexico, and Odekerk in Amsterdam in 2018. Moreover, at the 21st Century Museum Kanazawa in Japan in 2017, and Fondation Louis Vuitton in Paris in 2017. In 2020, they were awarded the Willem Lambrook Prize for Sculpture. In 2001, Cardiff and Miller represented Canada at the 14th Venice Biennial for which they received the Premio Speciale and the Benes Prize. Hey, so it's great to be talking to you, Janet and George, after quite a while. And we've been separated uh, over the last years, not only because of COVID, but because of your, your remote style of life in the west of, the, of Canada, uh, north of, of um, Vancouver. So it's great to, to see you, at least on the internet. Yeah, great to see you too, Carolyn. Yes, definitely. Uh, so here we are in this program called Digital PTSD. Part two, uh, I'm not sure uh, what digital PTSD uh, means or whether it really exists, uh, but we coined it here at Castello di Rivoli uh, as a way of exploring the possibility that the excess of uh, online life and life through the digital mediation uh, may be causing uh, with the acceleration of that during the COVID period, may be causing different kinds, different forms of, of, um, of uh, neurological or, or emotional distress, uh, social distress. Uh, women, uh, you know, closed in their houses being beaten and um, uh, children spending too much time on the internet uh, because they can't go to school and um, problems of all sorts seem to be emerging that, that have been noticed. And uh, this is not a Luddite uh, program. We're not against uh, uh, the history of technology and technological innovation, but we are kind of wishing to explore what needs to be somehow uh, changed or, 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 or be made better to find a better balance between our online and our offline lives. So. The reason I wanted to speak with you uh, in particular out of the many, many artists around the world um, that, that we, we could have engaged with on this occasion is because on the one hand, you are very, very knowledgeable in technology and you've always used technology in your work, especially um, uh, you know, uh, from the complex installations at the beginning, like Dark Pool or even to Touch, um, uh, and the, the way that, that George's knowledge of building things and making things has infused a lot of your works, to your using binaural recording in the audio and video walks and so forth, and um, to create environments that are very enveloping and uh, surrounding the viewers uh, in ways that will both take them away through storytelling, thanks to those technological usages, but also ground them in the here and now of their emotional experience. So I thought that you were experts <laughs> in this field and that you might have something to share with us. So um, my first question really connects with the fact that I think that you have um, invented basically augmented reality. Although the, the, yeah, the little narrative is that 
it started, you know, in 1992 with some research in some lab on virt virtual fixtures for basically military purposes to better um, do things, military things remotely. Uh, although that's the kind of little narrative and then in commercial usages comes up around the 2010 and so on with things like Pokemon games and so forth. I, I deeply believe that that first um, uh, audio walk, which you came across by chance in Banff, and maybe you can tell us about how that happened in 1991, um, really ushered in this concept that our experience was not either only technological or only embodied in the real world, but was somehow layered and, and you used this layering together. So starting from this uh, fact and looking at where we are today with companies trying to, you know, put people to sit down and not move like in some sort of matrix with the glasses on. Uh, uh, how do you see the development of society and your own art and the problems that have come up that you didn't expect and or, or the virtuous things that have come through this? Well, it made me think when you're talking about forced walk, the first one I did in 1991, and I was uh, doing research in the same kind of way that you would normally do with audio you you go out and you record something and you come back and you have some sort of player in the studio using installations or using this and that and because of a kind of like a little technical mix-up i end up listening to my own voice describing what was in front of me and all of a sudden my relationship to the idea of recording changed because then i realized that not only was my body active i could hear my footsteps and i could hear my breathing and then my, my physical body was responding to that. But um, it talked so much about how we exist within a certain technological time. You know, because you're listening to the past all the time, right? When you're listening to a recorded thing. But if you're walking in the present and thinking in the present with somebody who is in the past, it's like this whole connection through time and space, which always kind of interests me in a philosophical kind of way but also another thing that that the video the audio walks taught me and we've investigated a lot in in our work was how um intimate it was and how we need intimacy and all the feedback i've gotten throughout the years and um it was about how connected they felt to my voice and to my person so i started seeing it as almost like surrogate friendships i was completely safe you know, I, I don't have to put myself in the position of, of actually talking to people. But at the same time, the people who were doing it would be able to feel the connection. No, so so uh, you're saying that at the beginning, it allowed for a lot, the technological layering of this intimate voice allowed for forms of empathy mm -hmm. on the, uh, of, a, of a feeling with. So, mm -hmm. Do you think that um, at this stage, um, people have used this surrogate relationship through the digital as ways of separating also, and not only connecting in the way that we use it today? Mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that, that well, that, it idea? reminds me that when we started doing the walks, people were saying, but there was a lot of discussion in the culture about how isolating Walkmans are. But then we started getting feedback about how people felt that they saw more because you could hear things in the physical environment that you were, the people started realizing that they were actually experiencing their physical environment more. And so that's been one of the strategies. It's, it sort of enhanced your, um, all your senses, ha having the focus maybe on the sound or something yeah. or the, or taking your, your your sound away from you, you're hearing so much from the yeah. tape recorder that then every your sight became bigger in a way. Everything seemed a little crisper and but, so like I an think enhancement it, of reality. Yeah. So I think in ways it, it matters where you're listening because with these people, they were walking in an environment and Forest Walk was the very first one and it was in a forest, it was in nature. And 
if you're walking sort of like almost with a guide and you're seeing things more, then you're actually more connected. Because as we know, mindfulness is a very um, important thing these days. And, and it was weird that an isolating technology could create connection, if that yes. answers your question. Well, it does for the past. It does for what you were doing uh, at the beginning in this groundbreaking work. From I don't 90s. think you can. But my question would be, right now, it would seem that those technologies are being used not to actually uh, create walks. Yes. Or right. to make people move through environments, but they're more used to keep people still at a screen or, or near a... Yeah, like 3D virtual. Well, even this, I mean, it's an interesting idea that the antidote or to have a conference about um, <laughs> a digital PTSD and have people sitting in front of their screens for, I don't I'm not sure how long the conference is going to be. Many but, hours. Many hours, okay. So you're just adding to it, Carol. And you're making <laughs> yes, but you know, Adorno and the dialectic of the enlightenment uh, uh, is about uh, critical consciousness of being implicated in the problem. Right, of course. So it's yeah. just uh, <laughs> learning to uh, kind of navigate the problem in order to to be aware and have yes. a kind of critical position. But and, we, and, we also, like, and we also have no other option right now, so. <laughs> yes, that's what I mean. We also have no other option. But do you think that there is an excessive use? And if so, in what areas of technology? And the digital life. Well, not when, I talk, <laughs> when I talk to friends um, that have sons, usually, uh, that are the video game age and are obsessed with video games, it's a way for them to share communities. Like people who, kids that are bullied at school actually find communities online and they be, develop incredible friendships with this group of like 10 people or even more or less. Hmm. And they play, they, they make a time where they're all playing or you go on, you see who's playing and then you, you have, you know, you can talk to the side as you're playing the game. They have a lot. It's like the kids are always talking. They're talking to each other because they have their headsets. They're talking to each other. So it's like this camaraderie. So that has to be investigated as a, a way to um, make feel, kids feel connected. Like, and I was uh, talking to a curator in Paris. She said her son was very isolated according to where his school was. And, and, um, and then, but he was able to have this community of, of friends. So you see all games. the advantages in this digitalization. <laughs> You want us to go into the disadvantages? <laughs> well, no, not really, because we, we make sure we walk every day. We, you know, I, I'm so happy just walking along and feeling the, you know, the sunshine and the earth and, and, you know, we're next to a river and all that. That's super important to me. And if I said for, for anybody is, an, is a counteraction <clears throat> to video and our culture and Zoom and everything, it would be get outside. I can only well, speak from my own experience. I mean, do you think that meetings with Zoom are as useful as meetings in person that they have? They've been doing a bunch of studies on kids learning in, in the virtual classroom and that there's a difference in the way we learn when we're, when we're just presented with something that's a complete two-dimensional flat surface as opposed to learning is about something about three-dimensional. It's like uh, talking about in a previous conversation with you, we were talking about memory palaces yes. and how you create this three-dimensional space in your head. And, they, and this study about children's learning was that because you're, even if you're just in a classroom, mm -hmm. but you're surrounded by people, everything's three-dimensional and you learn in a different way than you do through this type of thing. So everybody out there in the world right now who's watching this won't be actually remembering anything I say because <laughs> it's just flat. <laughs> but what if that was in virtual 3D? Yeah, maybe. That, well, that's a study they'd so, have to do, right? It's, so they should be studying that, but, whether virtual 3D <clears throat> also But have we done, I works. mean, we haven't done any virtual 3D stuff. I mean, it's, it seems we, interesting, but I mean, it we... It makes me seasick. Yeah, every time we've ever done it, it, it makes me sick. The only thing I can talk about is just... Um, uh, having the phone recently, like a, and doing so much more on my phone than I used to do, 
um, I didn't used to ever do like read the New York Times on the phone and right. things the like smartphone. that. Oh. Let's call it the advent of the smartphone. Yeah, <laughs> and it, it just seems to there's something wrong with it that it makes. I miss newspapers. I miss being able to flip through a newspaper. I miss magazines. They, I mean, we still subscribe to as many magazines as we can, just because that that sensation is different than going th on a, on a phone. You just don't have enough space for. There's just something jumping in your ahead in your jumping. brain that it it functions mm -hmm. differently when you read the news on a tiny little phone compared to reading it on a newspaper and being you able mean to. You the scale of the body. There's something. It's not maybe the scale of the body. It may also just be that 3D thing that a newspaper is actually three dimensional, and you're and you're moving it, and you're uh, and you're scanning moving. it in a different way than but what about on the all phone. The you can't you can't you can flip, but it doesn't seem. I always feel like my my perception has become like a tunnel instead of open when I'm doing things on the phone. So in, in your work, technology is has been both. I mean, used in, in a really sophisticated way also to create that intimacy and that layering of the sensorial different senses. But it's also been a topic of dystopia. I mean, in Dark Pool, uh, the installation, one of your earliest works, it was the kind of laboratory of mad scientists like in science fiction uh, that was dystopic. And especially the key piece in terms of this is the piece uh, stemming from the Kafka, the penal colony, which is the, the piece that um, you made in uh, 2007, the killing machine. So uh, it does seem to have an ambivalent, uh, you have an ambivalent uh, uh, relationship with technology as a subject matter. Is mm -hmm. that intentionally just to be part of a kind of a line of science fiction? about this, this top, the fear of technology? Is it an intentional trope? Or, or uh, what is your relationship with this thing we call technology? I mean, Heidegger was very worried about it, given that he saw, you know, what happened with the atomic bomb and Hannah mm. Arendt. Yeah. And uh, other, uh, maybe Mary Shelley, you know, with her yeah. Frankenstein. But, um, and Metropolis, maybe film but but not 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 all you know not the futurists and so on and i've always seen your work as uh, very uh, complex in that relationship i mean uh, now we're in a very very technological era because of artificial intelligence and predictive algorithms that yeah. predict people's tastes so how do you feel about all that now and and why did you a narrativize, let's say, make narratives out of this technology, like in The Killing Machine, where it's actually a, a machine of torture. Yeah, in the same way that Kafka wrote about in The Penal Colony, right? It's a reference to that. But what you were saying also about Adorno and the inclusion of the spectator within the, the spectacle is something that we do with somehow we try to point out the technology that's happening at Nala. Like Killing Machine is the spectator that has to press the button and then the technology is not hidden. So you're, I don't know why it's important to us for, so, and we're working on a piece now too that's very much about stage direction and that you know they can see how they're being manipulated and the people that are seated what, looking at the installation, see the people coming in and, and being immersed in a spectacle and then, but they're removed. This whole idea of pulling in and pulling out with our work is so important in that we, we the viewer is pulled in to experience it, which is fun. And we use tropes and things like that to, and filmic devices to make sure people really are having fun with it, right? Yeah. We like, and we humor too. But at the same time, then we pull them back too. at the same time to realize, you know, in a postmodern way, I guess. But um, I think I think that maybe there's the, the ambivalence comes out there towards hmm. the technology. Um, people, when they talk about the communities that are built on the on the Internet now in, in when you when they speak about them, they speak about either emancipatory um, communities, you know, that 
arrive at by being more so many people arrive at a kind of political consciousness but also uh, they speak about the bubble society you know that we live in these bubbles which are these communities where you think everybody in the world thinks like you and agrees with mm. you and then you go off and storm the capital <laughs> and realize <laughs> that it was just a small number of people so yeah. um this what you're talking about being inside and being outside uh uh in the new work seems to be you uh, something around becoming aware of this of these bubbles maybe well the the what piece is, is actually work? very much about bubbles huh mm. Yeah. It's very much about isolated types of community and times of, of, of civilization. Can you yeah. explain, describe what you're working on a minute? Um, a little bit? Well, well, we're building, we we're stuck here in Grinrod in Canada and it, it's a bit limited. I mean, we love it here. We love the nature and everything. And I guess maybe that's why we started building models of cities and other things and I guess they're dystopic in a certain way we were inspired by Blade Runner many years ago we loved the original Blade Runner and it's been a kind of a I mean I, going back to you talking about our science fiction and dystopia I think that all comes out of Blade Runner and, and Philip K. Dick yeah. yeah and reading a lot of Philip K. Dick and okay. his kind of take on the future and it's and very, William Gibson and Neil Stevenson and yeah. all that yeah so yeah probably Margaret Atwood yeah. a lot of the writers that we read are, are science fiction and a lot of our ideas come out of that but so right now we're working on this new piece and it, it we we often work in um, series over over many years and so this piece we haven't we did Dark Pool you were talking about Dark Pool years and years ago I think it's 30 years old and this piece we're working on now is the first piece the second piece in the series of the, that because goes with Dark Pool. So it's a room that you'll go into like you've fallen outside of the gallery. And it's all about it, it like, smells and physicality, but there'll be models of, of these, there's these quite precise models of, of skyscrapers and Janet's building these, um, these strange... Um, Water old, tower plants that have been like in Chernobyl or something that had been abandoned. And so that's, there's all this like trees growing everywhere and stuff. Is it's, it real plants, live plants in these? No, 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 it's like dioramas. It's like we're creating, we're actually really relating to video uh, um, RPGs, role, role playing games. Really? Yeah, totally. For example, can you explain? Well, if you go on site and, and I mean, Google Necromundo terrain and you come up with all these guys making cityscapes or environments with castles and different things, but, um, all right. or abandoned cities or whatever for their games, then they play their games within that. Mm -hmm. And did they um, actually did they put little people in the yeah, game? yeah, then they had their little characters that they so that's very very <clears throat> and it's a whole other incredibly creative in um community because they make all their stuff, a lot of them you can buy it too, but they a lot of times they just make all their stuff, and then they're so in, amazing, and then they do YouTube videos how they paint them and how they paint the figures and all that but but games and um video games games and um game theory is really interesting. We've been talking a lot about it because we're realizing that um, like QAnon uses completely game theory in order to manipulate, manipulate people. people. Um, Trump was an example of, of using obvious uh, different devices that if you play a video game first, um, it's hard. It's hard to ex explain, but there's lots of really interesting articles about it now about um, how the use of fear, the use of alienation of people, and then they get into um, say something like QAnon. They release you know one statement saying, "Do your research, such and such, such," and so people start doing all this research, and then they share it with the community. Then they become part of this community. It's very much like cults. My best friend you was in off, was yeah. in the Mooney cult, and she was analyzing it with me. And that they use the same sort of process in QAnon as they do for getting people into cults. But then I was reading a video gamer analyzing how 
video games, you sort of write the same thing. You have to have an evil and you have to have a quest and you have to have the good person, like a hero, like some, for some people that's Trump and some people it's whoever is QAnon. And then you have to, you are given a role. And so they're doing, they're doing it all. It's just like perfect. But do you think that that is that that's a form of art, or do you think that? Oh, oh sorry, I got sidetracked into politics. Yeah, we were but, talking about our but, piece. No, but I'm that, interested no. in our that. our piece. We're we're interested in in the idea of how it's set up in terms of a very similar dioramas to what uh, these uh, role playing games were. But or, yours are uh, physical, miniature physical models, whereas yeah. the video games are online. It's yeah, like you, you're mixing video games and role playing games. They're very true. different things. So yeah, no, those role playing games sometimes understand. take part in the actual um, real environment. Yeah, and people but, actually interact with each other. But you can still do it online too. So. It's but a, they did the same thing if you um, follow a website called I Love Bees, where they created a. A whole mystery online, and they got people all invo involved in this. So, but, but anyways, we could go off in so many tracks like that. This? Okay, I George is giving me the eyes. So I'm great. not giving anybody the eyes. No, no. But my question is, what is this world? I mean, as an artist, are you reflecting, and in what way, philosophically, are you critiquing this, or are you? Uh, do you think that those very complex video games are that are collectively created at this point? Are artworks, and is it important to even wonder about that question, or is that an obsolete question? I think it 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 might be. Remember, you said years ago that the sort of Arta Povera was the the videos on YouTube. You mentioned that to me, and it always struck me as yeah, looking of our time, you mean. Of our time, you know, yeah. that 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 how we should look at culture and think about well. Um, is Lord of the Rings like a like a a masterpiece in the same way that the Sistine Chapel was, you know? Because you, when we first saw Lord of the Rings, it, it was amazingly high quality and and done things that no one else had done and things like that. Like the movie itself, remember that in Berlin? It's okay. Yeah. Yeah, but now now it's sort of okay. Yeah, yeah. It's, but um, so yeah, it's it's a good question about how the video games play out because some of them are really really interesting i've never done any of these video games so i can't answer the question whether it's art okay. or not i well, remember our nephew with um uh, the dark pool yeah he, he yeah, saw yeah. that he compared it he can like yeah, yeah he compared it to a video game or a piece of the dark pool so in some ways i think we're fascinated by those kind of immersive environments but we've always been more interested in the actual physical environments rather than something mm. that you do in, in a screen we want to be we want to be inside of of a, a real a real i like to touch things and feel things and smell things i mean that doesn't make sense i guess from in terms of the walks like the audio walks and the video no, walks where you, where, where you carry this little screen but i was thinking about what we were talking about before and how the internet is flat yeah. And the video screen is flat that we make the video walks in. But Janet was saying today, you were talking about how what happens is you're moving through a three-dimensional environment with the flat screen. And so we're, it's actually three-dimensionalized. And so it changes that whole feeling that you're not, that you're just looking at a screen. You're actually feeling almost like you're inside of it because so of the way you move. So what you're saying is that the technology could be used in ways to better connect the embodied experience and the, and the digital experience. Well, we wouldn't like use it if we didn't. Like, it's, like, what about what they did with Pokemon? I never played it, but no, it, we don't they know. had to go to all these different sites and find the Pokemon in these different yeah, sites. Yeah, and people would fall off of bridges. Yeah, exactly. That was a <laughs> bit crazy. Yeah. No, anyway. I, think that, I think that people are makers. Mm -hmm. Like, the human, human beings are, are makers. And we definitely, in COVID times, were producing a piece like Dark Pool. And we did, Dark Pool was about two artists being stuck in a room. And I think this piece is the same thing. Only we're creating only we're, other, other bubbles of civilization. Only this time we really are stuck in a room. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but people have to make something and be creative. And um, like, I, I, I think it's what you're 
maybe the generation, the paradigm that you're, you exist in, mm. that um, how you see creativity, but it would have to be analyzed then by someone who knows more about um, neuroscience, about whether the video games provide that, the 3D video games provide the three-dimensional world too. But um, there's some pretty amazing stuff out there, but uh, yeah, I think, we, I think we run a fine line. We're sort of ambivalent about technology in ways. We, we love it and we hate it. I mean, we've always really liked technology that can mimic reality quite closely, right? We love binaural sound because it's a recording, but sometimes you, it can fool your senses to think that there's a crow over there. And so we love that play of being able to fool people. And the video walks do the same thing, right? You, at a certain point when you're doing the video walk, you start to wonder why the person on the screen isn't out there in reality or vice versa why the person walking by you in reality doesn't show up on the screen there's this weird interplay between messing it's really messes with your okay. sense of reality and I so understand. i understand <laughs> so i think we can um wrap it up now okay and uh, since we're in this marathon and i think what i get out of this is that your practice as artists is a kind of a let's call it cure for digital PTSD in the sense that mm, all definitely. the works are ways of getting your hands into all of this uh, kind of exercising, exercising cre the, the capacity to join together the virtual and the non-virtual, the physical walking and the walking in the film. So it, you could say that your art is a sort of therapeutic art that doesn't reject um, the the technological, but that is a sort of um, yeah, like a yoga, like an exercise, like, yoga. like yeah. yoga. or or baking sourdough and, uh, bread. Look at how many people online have done sourdough you bread. You think our, our art our art is like baking sourdough bread? <laughs> well, if you don't make art, you have to make something. <laughs> but uh, the other thing about uh, Carolyn, you're calling us um, technological artists. But we use the most basic no. te technology. Rick, Your stuff, on, really. you design programs. Yeah, yeah, it's whatever. Pretty but, high tech. No, but I mean, a video walk is you take a, oh, yeah, a some, you take tech. something that's twenty years old technology. You can carry a camera around and you can create this immersive, um, high tech, experience. high tech experience. But it's really the most basic technology. We've we've uh, rejected using the goggles and all the other mm. stuff because we we don't find it compelling. Why? And so, because you have to go somewhere, sit in the room, be on your own, and you know it's fascinating for a while, but I'm sure it's so limiting. It's so physically it, limiting. Okay, well that's what I mean. So you're, I think that's what I meant. I think that you're saying that your art or your, your practice is uh, exploring ways of connecting and not limiting. So to get out of the limitations of the of the sitting in one room with the goggles. Yeah. yeah. To make it or, bigger. Make yeah. it more. Okay. Well, I mean, that's okay, also so why, sorry, that's also why in some way it, we've, we never did video art, video, like just a flat screen and a wall. We did the Paradise Institute, but you, the first thing about Paradise is it's a physical box you go into. It's a model of a cinema and it has binaural audio. And then you have our little home projection, uh, homemade film. But I think because we always felt, limited by that thing and it's the same with the other technological things that I mean even video was too high tech for us maybe am I saying that no <laughs> no it was too one liner too flat yeah exactly okay, I got it okay well uh, I'm gonna thank you all in Greenrod British Columbia <laughs> and we'll get on with our program I hope you can um, stay with us uh, throughout the, the the day or come in and out as you please today. Well, thanks for having us. It's great Thank to you. see you. Thank you.
I would like to thank Janet Cardiff and George Miller, who just engaged in conversation with our director, Caroline Christo Bakarjiv. They discussed their series of video and audio works in relation to media alienation. Their work has since a long time acknowledged and deployed digital screens has still affecting one's perception of their surroundings, transporting them to alternate realities. However, contrary to the visual flatness of smart devices, their work establishes a three-dimensional physical space in which transformative scenarios unfold. In the conversation we just heard, they discussed their approach to screen-based experience through their work, which ultimately diverts the attention back to our material relationship with the world. Thanks again.